learning how to be a physician and understanding it from the physician's perspective and getting a holistic understanding of the entire body system was sort of what drew me to medicine. Trying to understand why these little businesses in the med tech world that they would buy would be so innovative, you know, before they would be bought and then after they would bought, everything was sort of really incremental and what were the reasons why. If you want to have an innovative organization, you really need to have one that's really accepting of wild ideas. Dr. Josh Mackauer is the Boston Scientific Applied Bioengineering Professor of Medicine and of Bioengineering at the Stanford University Schools of Medicine and Engineering and is the director and co-founder of the Stanford Byers Center for Biodesign and founder of Stanford's Biodesign Policy Program. We've broken out the steps of, in of innovation so that it's not as daunting and it can be approached by anyone. Dr. Makar also serves as a special partner on New Enterprise Associates' healthcare team, supporting their med tech and health tech practice. Lastly, he is the founder and executive chairman of ExploraMed, a medical device incubator that has created 10 companies over the past 20 years. Innovation is something you can teach people. You can learn it. Um, you can get good at it. You can practice it. Um, and you can really build a career. This is Dr. Todd Brinton, Chief Scientific Officer at Edwards Life Sciences. I am pleased to introduce this episode, The Life Cycle of Innovation, which is part of the Healthcare Innovation Series presented by Edwards Life Sciences. Now, let's listen in as my good friend and colleague, Josh Mackauer, shares some of his extraordinary insights into the process of medical innovation and leadership. Welcome everyone to the Gary Bisbee Show. Uh, Nathan Bays here, obviously not Gary, but uh, but pleased today to be interviewing uh, Josh Mackauer. Josh is a uh, professor of medicine and bioengineering at Stanford. He's also director of the Biodesign Center at Stanford, which is just a fascinating organization and one that we will dive into today on the Gary Bisbee Show. So Josh, thanks so much for joining us today and, uh, and very much happy to have you here. Absolutely, it's uh, it's my pleasure to be here, and you know my um, my condolences to Gary's family and um, and to everyone who knew, knew him well. Yeah, no, thanks so much, Josh. It was a a very impactful, meaningful life that Gary touched so many of us. Uh, so we're happy to be doing this interview and, and kind of carrying on what he built here at Think Media. Um, well, Josh, look, let's jump right into your background. You've had a, a an illustrious career, which we'll we'll hope to cover it in part. Uh, we can't cover it all in the time allotment, but we'll cover some of it. But but tell us a little bit about you know how it all started. Sure, I grew up on the East Coast. Um, you know, I was uh, a creative kid. I liked music and photography, and um, you know, building things. I had a real fascination with. Um, you know, the intricacies of the human body. And, and I was really inspired by a television program back in the day called, uh, uh, the bionic man. Um, and that the idea of, uh, sort of creating, um, a superhero with technology, um, making people, you know, curing people, making them be able to walk or see or be strong or stuff like that was really, a, an inspiration for me as a kid. And I even, you know, sort of sketched in a notebook, um, at the age of like, I don't know, five or seven, you know, like my first invention notebook back then. So it was, uh, sort of a calling, I think. <laughs> yeah. So when did you decide that medicine was a, you know, a career path? When did medical school come into the picture? You know, as I was finishing, um, engineering school at MIT, I wanted to experience what I wanted to understand the human body. I wanted to understand disease. Um, I could have pursued a, a path, a, a PhD path, but I think the idea of learning how to be a physician and understanding it from the physician's perspective and getting a holistic understanding of the entire body system was sort of what drew me to medicine. And um, at that time, I thought that I, maybe I could be a practicing physician and an inventor and, and sort of do, do both. 
Um, and so I entered medical school, the classic in medical school, NYU, um, to really sort of learn it the way, learn it the way doctors learn it. And um, that was my intent. I wanted to, you know, go through the full training just to understand, um, you know, the treatment of patients from uh, the eyes of a doctor. Yeah, that makes sense. And what about business school? So you, you know, you were engineering yeah. medical school and then you went to, to business school. So you got the tri trifecta from a, from a degree perspective. How, how, when yeah. did the interest in, in kind of business come in? in yeah, that came later. Um, after I graduated from medical school, I went into the business world. Uh, I was uh, brought in, I was hired at Pfizer and as a technology analyst in the business development department working on a variety of things. Uh, this group was also responsible for overseeing all the R&D projects for all of Pfizer, which had a $2 billion medical device business at the time. So I was in, I was in uh, the medical technology side that Pfizer used to have. Um, and a few years into that, I realized that I was being viewed as the technical person, you know, the medical person, and all the business stuff was happening in another room. And I, I really wanted to be in the room where it was happening and it didn't seem like I had the, uh, the understanding of the language or what was really, you know, how people were framing why they were making certain decisions. It was all, um, accounting and, uh, in finance. And, and I felt like I really, really needed to understand that. So I lobbied to have Pfizer, uh, pay for my, uh, for my business, uh, education and I went to the executive program in Columbia and um, that was a great experience and, and really uh, I'm so glad I did it and really gave me gave me that perspective that I needed to operate on a, at a business level. So Pfizer was your first job after medical school. How long were you were you in that job and and when did your kind of the more entrepreneurial interests start to emerge? I was there for about six years um, and during that time you know I had an opportunity and experience that really shaped my entire career in, to this day, honestly, um, which was that Hank McKinnell, who was the CFO at the time, he later became the president of Pfizer, but he's the guy that picked my resume out of a stack, asked me to do a special project. And the project was focused on trying to understand why these little businesses in the med tech world that they would buy would be so innovative, you know, before they would be bought and then after they would bought everything was sort of really incremental and what were the reasons why. And, um, and that was a, like a side project, not part of my everyday job, but it was the, it was the thing that really shaped everything I did next because what I saw there was that as an independent innovator, these founders were going after solving a problem without a particular technology in mind. And they would find the best technology to solve it. And they'd really just create a whole field, a, a whole new um, product category by doing that. Yet once they were an established company and they were, let's say, a balloon company um, and they were purchased by Pfizer, they were just looking for new ways of improving the balloon or using the balloon. They really weren't thinking about, you know, how do we get the next big advance for our customer that could be a technology that we don't even have today. And so I came back and showed, showed that to him and said, I think, you know, the, to the key difference here is we just need a different process. Uh, one that starts on needs um, and, but starts with the strategy of where you want to be, but starts with those customers and, and is agnostic to technology and solves a problem with the best technology and said, okay, that sounds logical, but why don't you prove it? And so he gave me the resources to set up a little incubator inside of Pfizer. And over those years that I worked on that incubator, we developed, we sort of broke the process down because the whole idea was that we needed to teach it to the rest of the R&D organization. So I, I segmented it out into steps and, you know, you know, we took a lot of uh, learnings from others that were working on innovation processes and adapted them and sort of created a, an innovation process that was pretty novel. Um, and that was the origins of the biodesign process, honestly, that that is the process that I've used as a in an inventor myself, as well as uh, what we've taught to, you know, thousands of people at this point. <laughs> what are some of the things you can do in addition to what you just shared, but thinking about it more from kind of the governance leader, you know, leadership perspective, which was a focus of, you know, Gary's show here, you know, how should management teams and, and, and boards be thinking about? 
that really is something that I, you know, obviously some people are have it, have it innately. I don't think I do. I've had to learn it. Um, and, uh, and it's super important. And if you want to have an innovative organization, you really need to have one that's really accepting of, um, wild ideas, give them a little bit of space in the room and in the air to, to sort of be considered, um, consider the disruptive ideas, the, the frustrating ideas that, you know, um, you sort of don't necessarily want to listen to, but you really should and, and create an atmosphere that allows for that disruption. Um, at the same time, once you've committed to something, you know, setting a very high bar for, for, tweaks and add-ons because you could be in R&D forever, you know, so you have to, you have to be able to switch modes. We go from this mode of anything's possible. How do we solve this problem? Let's throw everything against the wall. Yet we're matching them to this criteria set. And when we find one that matches and we think, wow, this could actually be a reasonable solution. The next thing we, we do is after we fully formed it, then, then our mole, a goal is why should this survive? How do we kill this as soon as possible? Like, what's the what's the killer thing that's going to tell us this is the wrong way to go? And we try to do that as soon as possible. We're shifting between those types of modes, and similarly, in the in the mode of like, let's go solve something. Let's come up with a disruptive idea. Once we lock in and we can't kill it, then it's like we're on this thing. Stay the course. So you know, in in kind of studying a little bit about your background, um, I mean completely amazing 300, you know, plus, you know, patents, just talk a little bit about, you know, that, you know, kind of the, you know, the inventor, right. And how that meshed throughout your career with, you know, the different you know, yeah. the large, you know, Pfizer, the first shot the, the incubator, yeah. you know, what you've done, how do you, you know, how do you think about kind of the invention? Piece? Yeah. You know, where do you get your ideas from? I mean, honestly, I get my ideas by following the process. You know, people are like, hey, you got another idea for your next thing? I'm like, no, I have no idea what's next. I'm, I, I'm very, very disciplined. Um, if you look at my patents, I would say 98% of them are in, attached to projects that we actually did, that we actually tr attempted to or actually did bring to market. So um, that means we've given a lot of stuff away. If I have an idea and I'm not going to pursue it, I'm not going to patent even if it could be successful in someone else's hands, I figure that might prevent someone from actually doing it. So I don't want to stop innovation. I don't want to block others. I just want to do something good. So I'm going to focus my efforts on the things I'm actually going to do and try to protect those like all get out. <laughs> but, I, but I'm not going to prevent other inventors. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Well, you know, I, you know, this is obviously a healthcare show, and and our conversation will be focused on healthcare. But it feels like a good time to ask you about: uh, Is it Corvin? Is that how you? Oh yeah, <laughs> which is which is a a company slash invention that you had, which is it's not healthcare related. So no, uh, you know, uh, it's although I'm sure here. there we go. I'm sure many guests on the uh, the Gary or there are many guests and listeners on the Gary Bisbee show are uh, are wine connoisseurs and wine drinkers. Yeah. So would love to hear a little bit more about uh, about that invention and that company. Yeah, sure. Um, so this one I'm co-founder of. Um, my So at Pfizer, I brought in, uh, hired a great guy named Greg Lambrecht, who's an incredibly creative guy. And, um, you know, uh, using the biodesign process, Greg um, identified the need of, you know, needing to have, you know, if you want a glass out of a bottle, there's really no way to do it without destroying all the wine in the bottle. So um, the uh, the using that neat spec, neat statement, as we would call it in the formal process of biodesign, it sort of created one of the criteria, you know, you have to be able to take out as much as you want, you know, and it has to not in any way impact the wine in the bottle and uh, realize that the only way to do that is to never open the bottle, but to exchange the wine out of the bottle at the same time as passing in an inert gas. And so what it does is it, uh, and he experimented with a number of different gases and uh, wound up with argon, uh, which is used in you know food packaging, it's completely inert. And uh, what's cool is you could take a glass out of this, this bottle 
and uh, and the glass, you know, the, the wine in the glass, of course, will be exposed to air and it'll start to go through its maturation process, which is part of the good thing about it. But the wine in the bottle is completely inert and you literally can leave it for years and have one glass out of a bottle every, you know, for five years or more. Uh, it's a half a glass, 10 years, and the wine continues to evolve normally and it's amazing. It's just an amazing technology and it's it's really a net, it's a, it's a global brand now. Um, and I'm still on the board and, uh, it's, it's been fun. Well, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the biodesign process and, and, you know, the, the, you know, the buyer center for biodesign at Stanford yeah. where, where you're the director. So you were an initial kind of founder of the, right. of the center 20 plus years ago, and then recently, you know, come back to, to lead the center as, as director. Maybe share with the the audience, you know, what is the the, the buyer center for biodesign? Yeah. What kind of work do you do? Absolutely, uh, dive into the biodesign process. Yeah, um, look, our mission is to uh, train the next generation of innovators. Um, you know, what we've done is is sort of like I said, we're ta- we've broken out the steps of in- of innovation so that it's not as daunting and it can be approached by anyone. Um, and we believe that it can, you know, innovation is something you can teach people. You can learn it. Um, you can get good at it. You can practice it. Um, and you can really build a career around it. Um, and more formally, I mean, we actually now, I now see the potential of the biodesign process being an incredibly useful tool for economies, um, that are, looking for how do they grow uh, and also for addressing global health equity. So with the biodesign, you know, the, uh, the biodesign uh, center here is really focused on that. I mean, we want to train people. We train undergraduates, graduates, fellows. We actually train faculty here um, on this so that they can sort of find the right places to apply their research ideas um, and clinical faculty, the right way to solve the problems that their patients are having. We train global faculty. We have several here right now from across the world, faculty from other institutions who are training on how to teach it. And so they will go back to their organizations. And at this moment, there are 80 uh, plus programs across the world, literally in almost every, on every continent, um, uh, using biodesign, uh, teaching students biodesign and using our textbook. Um, and, uh, and, you know, our students themselves, uh, while they're training have invented and created over 56 companies, um, which have touched the lives of oh, almost 8 million people so far, uh, with their products. Um, and that's just while they're training, there's double that amount of companies that they created after the program. I'm very thankful at the support of several um, organizations like Edwards uh, and others to, to set this uh, to set this up. But the goal is really to, to identify all the roadblocks to innovation and uh, inform policymakers uh, through research that brings those issues to light, but also train the next generation of policymakers as well that, that will focus on innovation. When we're talking about you know, innovations that could potentially extend life, improve life, you know, that's a long time to, to go from kind of a, the creation, you know, and, and the discovery to the actual, you know, widespread implementation. So any type of improvement, you know, that, uh, around speed while protecting from a safety perspective, of course, you know, is, is critical. What are just a couple of lessons learned from, from, you know, everything that's, you know, kind of crossed, yeah. crossed your desk, right. As, uh, as a leader, as a board member, you know, any any words of advice to you know yeah. fellow board members or aspiring entrepreneurs you know how they should think about you know kind of building businesses and then also you know the governance structure around early stage and growth stage companies right lots of lessons learned <laughs> sure. I'm still I'm still learning them I, I keep on thinking when am I going to get this get this down right <laughs> why am I still learning now but uh but yeah, I mean, some things that are central themes are people are everything. People are a company. You know, the idea is important, but it's not the most important thing. Having good people, you know, good culture, um, uh, that's everything. Um, you know, if you got that right, 
you got some good people with you, yeah, you can accomplish almost anything. The next one is perseverance. Um, there are a million ways to fail. And failure is just always just, you know, licking at your heels. You know, it's just always there. And, um, and sometimes, you know, early on, failure is good. I mean, if you can, if you can, before you've brought all the investors on board and, you know, before you've made all sorts of commitments, if you can kill something early, that's great. You know, then you save yourself so much hassle. But once you're on the journey, um, you know, it's about landing the plane. I mean, you, you know, you can't like, you know, pilots can't go, ah, you know, <laughs> we're bailing out. Hey, see you all uh, passengers. Uh, you know, we'll see you. See you. Maybe. Um, good luck flying, you know, landing the plane. You know, I think you have to land the plane. And, um, and I think that takes tremendous perseverance, um, whether it's financing challenges or building the right team, overcoming regulatory, I mean, reimbursement. There's just technical, uh, even clinical challenges. It's just so hard, but you have to see your way through. And I think the guiding light through all that is focusing on what's best for the patient. Well, let me ask you this question. Maybe not a fair one, but but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, <laughs> which is, you know, of everything that's going on in, let's call it, I would call it kind of medical innovation broccoli. You've got yeah. whole gene therapies and the advancement that's going on there, just tremendous. You've got a lot of really, you know, interesting, you know, kind of step function advancements around cardiac, you know, and what's going on with the cardiology with the heart. Like, what are you most excited about if you just step back and kind of look at the entire ecosystem? Yeah, I mean, I... I... I mean, I love breaking new ground, and I love it when my when our fellows and students break new ground. I mean that that is the biggest, most exciting moments of my life. You know, to do something that's never been done before, see something that no one's ever seen before. You know, at this stage in the evolution of humans and technology, to be on the edge and do something and go, oh my God, this actually works, you know, like, and no one believed it or no one saw it or, you know, and to be, you know, in the room where that happens, it's just, I mean, that I, I, that's why I'm still creating companies and working on new technologies myself, as well as, you know, teaching others to do it. But I mean, it's, it's the best. Well, you've certainly, you've certainly been on the edge for, for your entire career and you've created a lot of the future. Josh, thank you for, uh, for joining us on the Gary Bisbee Show. So I appreciate it. Thanks for the invitation. 